Today we're going to do a quick teardown of this SkyPlus HD box where the main intention is to salvage the hard drive from it. However, I'll go into a lot of detail showing all the different parts to show how it's constructed in addition to removing the hard drive. My parents recently upgraded to SkyQ, which is Sky's new TV service, which came with new boxes, which meant they had two of these older boxes sitting completely unused that they just wanted rid of. Unfortunately, these boxes are pretty much worthless. I mean, you can buy them on eBay for like 10 quid, and that's coming from a proper company that sells them with a warranty and everything. So it's really just not worth trying to sell this, these sort of things. I mean, I can maybe get a fiver for it, but at that point, it's not even worth me taking it to the post office. It's just not worth the effort. However, rather than just completely scrapping the boxes as they are, it's worth salvaging the hard drive from them. This box here has a 500 gig hard drive and it can go up to two terabytes. So it's definitely worth doing that before you throw the box out. So what we'll do is we'll take it apart, see how we get inside, see how we get the hard drive out, and then we'll look at how it's built. I've seen quite a few videos of people taking these apart on YouTube, and it's a bit unintuitive to take apart, so what people tend to end up doing is completely destroying the casing while they're doing it, which is okay while, if you're just salvaging the hard drive and never wanting to put it back together again. But you may also want to open one of these if you wanted to upgrade the hard drive or replace a faulty one, in which case you want people to be able to put the box back together again. So what I'll do is I'll demonstrate the proper procedure for opening it up and taking the drive out without damaging the casing. One important thing to bear in mind if you're ever taking apart set-top boxes like this is to check the ownership of them. With Sky on the legacy Sky boxes like this, you're okay. The customer owns the box outright so they can do what they want with it. However, with other providers such as Virgin Media and the new Sky Q boxes, the, the customer doesn't own the hardware. The hardware is effectively leased from the provider. So if you've got one of those boxes, don't go taking it apart or selling it or you know, dumping it or trying to modify it because you're not going to get prosecuted for it, but you know, you could get, you know, mega sort of charges from the provider to replace the hardware. So don't go doing that. But at least with these legacy sky boxes, the customer is the owner and they are allowed to take it apart. So now before we take the box apart, we'll do a quick tour of the outside of it just for people that haven't seen this sort of box before, possibly people out, out with the UK. So here's a box here. These are standard satellite DVRs, so they can do pause and rewind live TV, they do, time, they do recording, they do time scheduling, and they've got two satellite tuners so you can record two things at once or watch one thing while recording another. And these are provided by the UK TV provider Sky, which is the UK's main satellite TV provider. So in the front here we can see they've got the box, so it's got a set of buttons on the front here, as well as a set of buttons on the top. These boxes are quite unusual in the fact that you can pretty much fully use them without a remote control. There's enough buttons on the front of these to work you know, pretty much any function of it, which is pretty useful. I suppose it's particularly important for like commercial environments like pubs where people tend to lose remote controls and they just want to be able to control the, the box with the buttons on it. So that's quite good to see. You've then got a set of LEDs here to indicate status. This is a sort of ring LED that sort of spins around to indicate activity for recording and playback. A couple other LEDs there. And then you've got this little flap here that opens up to reveal a USB port which isn't actually used for anything and the smart card. This is a Sky viewing card which holds all the decryption keys for the paid TV service. You see that's the card there. And on the bottom of the card, we can see we have a little chip. It's a standard sort of smart card type thing. And that's hold all the decryption keys to access the paid channels. Taking a look around the back of the box, we have the power connection, which is a standard figure of eight IEC connector, composite video, digital audio out over coax or optical, two satellite inputs from the dish, an aerial input with two aerial outputs, SCART, HDMI, Ethernet, USB and eSATA which aren't used, and a telephone line which is an old way you used to, have to put, you used to have to connect these to a phone line so they could call back to Sky for certain things. You don't need to do that nowadays but you did used to have to connect that up. And then a sort of RS-232 serial port. Ports such as eSATA and RS-232 and USB aren't used on these. However, what Sky tend to do is they tend to provide ports that aren't actually used but they might enable them in future software versions. A good example of this is the Ethernet port which Skybox have had for many years but previously wasn't actually used for anything. However, later on, Sky launched a catch-up TV service that could work on these boxes and enabled the Ethernet port for that. And in later revisions of the boxes, they released ones with built-in Wi-Fi. So these ports are never actually used, but they could have been used in the future. So they will actually be connected inside and everything. One interesting thing with these is the sheer amount of connectivity you get because Sky need to provide these boxes to all their customers no matter what sort of TV or AV setup they have which is why it ranges from modern HDMI all the way back to things like SCART and even RF modulator outputs. In fact, my parents actually used the RF modulator outputs on these boxes because they had a TV in the kitchen, which was just all the, all the only cabling to that was an aerial cable that ran away under the floor under the house. 
So even when they were using it up until like, you know, a couple of months ago, they were actually using the RF modulator output to feed a video signal from the box in the living room through to the secondary TV in the kitchen. But yeah, that's outside of the box. So what we'll now do is we'll see how we take it apart. So the boxes are quite sort of weirdly constructed. It's a sort of metal box inside with this plastic shell around it that you need to remove. And it's a little bit unintuitive on how you take it out because there's a lot of screws you don't actually have to remove to get into these. So let's take a look at how you get inside. Now the only screws you actually need to remove from one of these boxes is the two on the back. You also need to take the viewing card out, otherwise it gets in the way a bit later. But this is the only two screws you need to take out. So take out that one there. And take out the one on the other side. Cool. Now with both those screws removed, we just need to turn the box upside down. And on the bottom, you'll see there's two little plastic clips here and here that lift up. Like that. So what you need to do is you lift the plastic clip up and then slide the silver piece backwards. So you do that there and then you slide it off like that. And with that slid back, that just sort of, you sort of wiggle it and that comes loose. And same for the other side, so we'll try and make it easier to see. So lift the clip up, slide the plastic back, and pull it off. Now that these bits are removed, you've almost unlocked it. These bits of plastic here clip into this metal piece and hold it in place. It's quite a clever design, actually. So what you then need to do is actually remove the main box from the casing. So you'll need to break the warranty seal, obviously. Um, doesn't really bother me, <laughs> it's an ancient box anyway. And then there's this little clip here, you just lift this clip up and then you slide the, metal the whole metal assembly in the middle backwards from the main outer plastic shell. And when you've done that, you can see that's now detached. Now this bit gets a bit fiddly, you sort of have to just hinge this out, and it does just require a bit of brute force, but now that's out. We've now got the plastic shell removed, so you can see that's it there. Huge big plastic assembly that goes on top. And now let's take a look inside the box. So now we're inside the box, we can start seeing how it works. So on the top here, we have this little board here covered with buttons. So there's just, these are all the buttons that go through that panel on the top. Then over here, there's a second board that also has all the buttons accessible through the front. We then have the IR receiver for the remote control. This interesting cluster of LEDs here, which provides that animated sort of playing spinning circle thing. And then a few more LEDs over here that provide the status indicators for things like the phone line, remote control activity and standby and stuff like that. Also interestingly, you can see this is a single-sided board. So there's all these individual jumper wires here used to you know, effectively make enough traces across the other side of the board to connect it all up because they've used a single-sided board to save costs. These devices are very much built down to a cost. So it's quite interesting to see how these are built, see how they manage to save money. So what we now need to do is remove the main top case here, which also requires us to remove this little board here. Now one interesting thing I've seen on this that I've never seen on anything else before is rather than using screws, they've obviously tried to save money and instead of that, they've used these little twisted metal things, which is the best way I can really describe it. What they've effectively got is little metal tabs that stick up from the main case, or you know, physically attached onto this, or just basically bent away from it when they've made it. And it sticks up through little slots in the PCB or little slots in the metal casing. And then they just twist it slightly, and then that holds it in place. So in order to remove this board, what we need to do is get a pair of pliers, grab that little tab, and just twist it to be straight with the rest of it. Same on this one here. So just grab that, twist it around a little bit. And when you twist these so they're, they're straight again, you should then just be able to lift this board off over the tabs. And then that, you know, hinges out the way. And yeah, you can see those little things there that we had to bend out of the way. It's an interesting thing, I've never seen something built like that before. But I suppose it's probably cheaper than, than using screws and maybe even easier to assemble. Now with that out of the way, we'll also need to remove this board, this board on the front. There's a cable here connecting that up so we can pull that off. In theory. Yeah, there we go. Stiff, come on. Here we go. That comes off. And there's more of these little twisty things we need to undo on this PCB as well. It's probably worth you actually doing this to reassemble it, make sure you twist in the correct direction. Imagine if you twist them the wrong way around, you might snap them off. So try and figure out which way they are actually twisted. And then with all those untwisted, we should be able to just lift this little plastic clip up and remove that whole board. There's one of those is still slightly squint and hopefully that will start to unclip there we go that's coming off yep and that board's now removed and then 
This little board here, which I don't quite know how it comes off yet, this one's just some little plastic clips for the buttons. I've got absolutely no idea why they make that a separate board, not just put it on one big PCB, but that's obviously what they decided to do for some reason. In fact, bizarrely, that's actually broken off from the same PCB. So, you know, no idea why they didn't just, you know, make that one PCB, why they had to make that two separate bits. Unless it's like a durability thing, they want this plastic behind it to make it more durable when you're putting force on the buttons. Not sure. And you can see on the bottom there some, you know, how it's all built. And interesting, there's actually a little chip there. And that chip will be the one that provides probably just, I don't know, some sort of serial communication, some sort of little microcontroller for animating that spinning thing, something like that. Pretty interesting seeing that there. Try and look the part number up and see if there's any information that I'll put on your screen about it. Now with all that removed, we can now remove the top case. So we just need to twist all these little things around on the outside of it, so we can access it. And then the top should just lift off. So that's them all now twisted out of the way, so we should just be able to lift this whole metal piece off. There we go. So we need to lift, pull it away at the front there to unclip it, and then that just comes off. I'd also probably be quite careful with this because it is very sharp metal, it's not really designed to be nice to work on. So now let's take a look inside the box. So over here we can see, we have, well up here we can see we have the main board, this obviously has the processor on it that we'll, that we'll take a look at later. The SATA connector to the drives goes there and this has a bunch of inputs and outputs on the back. There's then a large board to board interconnect that we'll see soon that connects this board to this board down here. And this board contains the smart card reader, the USB port which probably just comes up to the CPU here, some of the um, audio and analog connections are on here and then interestingly so is the power supply so the power supply is actually located down here on the same board as some of the digital and analog circuitry and then there's these huge big you know slots cut out around the power supply and then the transformer sort of straddles the two sides so this will also be high voltage and this will be low voltage so the first thing we need to do is to get inside any further we need to take this top board out so what you need to do is there's a single screw holding this in but what's also holding it in is around the back We've got two little sort of nut things around the F-plugs for the satellite connection. These need to come off, as well as a screw on the HDMI connector and the two sort of screws on the side of the serial port. So take a look, take all those out, and then we'll be able to get this board out. So we've now removed all those screws. So what I need to do is get that single screw on the board out and then remove all the cables so we can lift it out. So, that comes out there. And just disconnect the fan, which is a little fan located down here to cool the box. I imagine this probably turns on and off because I've never really heard these running, but they do actually, it does actually have a fan, which probably explains why there's so much dust over here from many years of sitting under a TV sucking in dust. And then we've got the SATA and whatever this cable is. So we'll just disconnect that. Actually, yeah, so this cable looks like that's actually from the front, for the front USB port, so that, yeah, because it's similar number of wires, sort of USB, and that then goes straight from here right down to next to that USB connector, so I guess that's what this cable is here. They obviously couldn't fit it on the board board interconnect. So we can lift that out there, and then same goes for the SATA connector, which is actually quite a nice locking one. They've used quite a nice sort of locking type SATA connector on this, which I suppose makes sense because you don't want these coming loose and, you know, having customers phone up saying the box is broken, so... They will actually make these to be re reasonably reliable, although my parents had many of these boxes fail. They weren't, they weren't the best. But now that that's all removed, we should be able to then just lift it up in this board board interconnect and remove the board. So that just lifts up like that, and then the board just slides out. So that is the main processor board, so we'll take a look at that now. So now here we have the main processor board. Also on the back we've got two satellite connectors, the HDMI, the Ethernet, USB, eSATA, phone line and the serial port. Then internally we've got that USB header that goes off to the USB port, or at least that's what I think it is. A single SATA port and then that board to board interconnect. As far as chips on this we can see over here we've got the two satellite tuners which appear to be driven by a single chip that's shared between the two. So along here we have three RAM chips. The top two here are each one gigabit. And the one down the bottom here is different, it's actually 512 megabits. So that gives this machine a total of around about 320 megs of RAM. However, I'm not sure if you know all of these are a system RAM or maybe some of this is video RAM or a cache for something. 
so I'm not quite sure how the arrangement's configured with respect to what the CPU uses these chips for. Up the top here, there's a NOR flash chip, which is 512 megabits, so that's about 64 megs of flash this thing has available. Then under the, under the seat sink, we then have the main CPU. Obviously, if you're taking your box, box part and planning on using it again, it's probably not worth taking this off, but because I'm not actually going to use my box again, I may as well take this off and see what's underneath. So that'll come off, and it's probably going to... That actually came off fairly easily. Yeah, just a thermal pad under there so it doesn't actually get stuck too badly. And then here we can see the main chipset. That's the main chipset on this, which is a Broadcom chip. So it's a BCM7335 QKF SBA1G. So that's the main chip that drives the whole skybox. See under there with a nice big integrated heat spreader on top. And obviously it's significantly cleaner around the outside where the heatsink's been cover it, covering it from the dust and protecting it. So that there is the main sort of digital board in the box, and there's that board to board interconnect there, which just holds through the PCB, and then go into this sort of connector block on top. So now back inside the box, we can see we have this main board. So this has the power supply on it, which is sort of separated by these big slots with a few components bridging them. And then down the back here, we've got all the analog video circuitry, some analog audio, and the digital audio down here as well. Now over in the smart card area, we have a chip. This is an NXP TDA8024T. Now this is listed as a standard smart card interface. So all it seems to be is just a chip that handles all the voltage conversion and powering a smart card and provides an easy to, easy to sort of implement interface to a CPU. So it's not doing anything that fancy, it's just an interface between the smart card and the box's main CPU. Also interesting down here, we've got a microchip microcontroller. This is a PIC 16F26, which is the basic microcontroller from microchip. So I'm not sure what they're using this for, because obviously they've got the main CPU. I wonder if it's just some sort of bus communication to allow them to connect, you know, have more stuff talk over this interconnect here. They're just using it for something for that. It's a bit interesting, but I suppose it means if they have a bit of logic down on this board, they can have to send less, less data up to the main CPU. Over here, we've then got that ribbon cable that connects out to the front panel. And then this Molex here that goes off the hard drive. So that just unplugs there from the main board, which is completely stiff. Again, they'll always use really tough connectors on these to make sure they don't come loose. There we go. And this is a female connector on the actual cable and a male connector on the board. So it's like the opposite from what you'd normally see in some sort of Molex SATA adapter. So now finally, let's get the hard drive out. So we'll cut this cable off, take the cable as well, because it might be useful. So let's cut that cable tie. Um, so that gives us the Molex to SATA connector, which isn't necessarily, I think it's actually locked in. Yeah, it's locked in there which isn't actually that useful because it's the wrong gender of Molex, but it's still, you could maybe use one of the ends and cut it in half or something. Although again, this is that moulded style of SATA connector that I really don't like due to issues with these short circuiting in PCs, but that's what they've used. I've not heard of issues with these boxes, so hopefully these, this would be okay. And then here we've got the SATA cable as well, which is actually quite nice because it's lockable, so I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't say no to using that in like my PC pretty much, you know, it's right angled on one end, straight through on the other, and lockable, so. There you go, it's that connector as well. And then now we can take this drive out. So what we've got is on this side of the drive, you've got this bracket, which has a single screw in the middle and two of those little metal twisted things. So we need to twist those two metal things out like that, and then remove the single screw as well. Out. And then there's now two more screws on the front of the drive, so that's just there. And there's these, oh, there's three I think, yeah there's three screws here. I'm not sure if all these need to come out or if one of them maybe holds the drive in. Take the middle one out first. Yeah, so that comes out, that's not actually released the drive, so take these out as well. I imagine that all these screws need to come out, I imagine one holds the caddy in place. Yeah, so that comes out there. And now we've got the drive, so that's it there. And yes, yeah, so yeah, actually, yeah, all those screws were required, and that is now the hard drive. So now here's the hard drive, which is a 500 gigabyte Seagate Pipeline HD2. These are hard drives designed for optimized for DVR use. They are standard SATA drive and will work as a normal SATA hard drive. They're just designed for DVR use. So they're designed for 24/7 operation. 
and the firmware is optimized for large sequential writes and sequential reads because that's what these drives do when they're dealing with video rather than random access like a PC would do. So they would work in a normal PC as well, they just might not be completely optimized for that use. So we've got the bracket on here, which I think is now just stuck on because I've removed all the screws. I think they're just some sort of adhesive, yep, holding that on. So that just, yeah, breaks off. In fact, that's not actually adhesive. That's just a, like a rubber anti-vibration like, anti thing to make the box quieter. I think the rubber's just deteriorated over the years and becoming a bit, become a little bit tacky. So that comes off there. And then on the other side, there's just two screws holding this little metal plate on. So there you go, now with those brackets removed, we just have a standard 500 gig SATA drive. I mean, it's not the most useful thing in the world. I mean, I've got tons of old hard drives, even spare SSDs and stuff, but I mean, they're useful. I mean, you can always have these kicking around. And having a drive is it's better than having no drive. I'd always, even when I'm, th when I'm throwing out any sort of box like this, I'd always just pull the hard drive out because it's the one part of this that is actually reusable. So yeah, there's a hard drive recovered. Then finally inside the case we've got this fan, which I think is about 60mm, and it's a sun and 12 volt DC fan basically. There's no speed control or anything, it's just a standard 2 pin DC fan, so it's not really that exciting. But I don't think these things, I think it turns it on and off or the fan's really quiet. So yeah, you don't actually really hear the fan in these boxes at all. So there you go, that was a teardown of a Sky Plus HD box. It was pretty interesting to take apart, see how it's built, see all the individual components. And it was definitely worth taking apart just to salvage the hard drive. And there's also quite a few other components you could potentially use, you know, you can maybe, you know, the heat sink might be useful for certain projects. These cables are, you know, completely usable. You can even like salvage things like that little LED module off that board and stuff. So it is definitely an interesting thing to take apart. And if you're getting rid of a box like this, I'd always recommend taking it apart and pulling the hard drive out because it's the one part that is actually reusable from these things. However, as I mentioned earlier, before you do this, always check with your provider to make sure you do actually own the box and you're not taking apart the provider's property. But apart from that, yeah, it was a pretty fun project to take apart. So there we go. Thank you very much for watching.